गुड आफ्टरनून गाइस चैताली दिस साइड आई होप माय स्क्रीन इज विजिबल टू ऑल एंड यू ऑल कैन हियर मी काइंडली पुट यस इन द चैट बॉक्स इफ यू इफ आई एम ऑडिबल टू ऑल एंड यू ऑल कैन सी द स्क्रीन yes thank you so much guys uh, guys please note we are waiting for other participants to join in as i can see many of the participants are still in the lobby they are getting in so we we'll wait for them to join in and we'll start the webinar in few minutes i request all the participants to note that we are starting the webinar in few minutes uh, till the time uh, we have shared the social media platform link as well as the links for the communities on which we do okay. update the relevant upcoming uh, relevant uh, updates on upcoming webinars workshops and trainings so you all can go and follow us over there you will get updates on the upcoming workshops trainings on the certification which we do also other details has been mentioned in the chat box for you all you all can go and check it okay so let's get started with the webinar uh, we are into part 1 of az 900 uh, we have divided this uh, training into part uh, today is the first day and tomorrow we'll wind up with the second half of az 900 so welcome you all in this az 900 certification training chaitali this side uh, your host and i will quickly present few details before for starting up the webinar so today's webinar is sponsored by synergetics uh, synergetics is india's one of a kind corporate learning solution company uh, synergetics do believe in delivering training to solve the customer pain points uh, by crafting cutting edge learning solutions synergetics provide solutions and the trainings on the solutions like persona based uh, onboarding onboarding add on solution certification solution certification add on solution then we have reskilling solution emerging technology training solution certification hackathon solution uh, cloud adoption solution latest technology training solution then we have sales pre sales training solution practice playbook solution and architecting solution then how you will get trained with the help of us it will give if we, it will give a complete learning experience the training will give you a learning experience you can you can get trained build confidence to appear for the exam and get recognized uh, that is to get uh, certified then how you can advance yourself with the certifications uh, there are three types of certification uh, we have first fundamental that is basic level of certification 
then the second level of certification is advanced role based certification and we then we have uh, expert level certification in fundamental certification uh, synergetics do provide training on az 900 which is azure fundamental then we have ai 900 azure ai fundamental dp 900 azure data fundamental then we have PL900 Power Platform Fundamental and SC900 Security Compliance and Identity Fundamental. And in associate level certification, uh, we have uh, many uh, certifications like the AZ104, then we have AZ204. Also, we do have DP series, SC series and PL series. Then talking about the expert level certification, Synergetics provide training on AZ305. Then we have SC100, SC PL600 and AZ400 in expert level certification. Then this is the specialty. Uh, on which we do provide certifications. Uh, the certifications uh, are AZ1, AZ120, then we have AZ140 and AZ220. Those who are interested in getting uh, certified in any of this certification, uh, do connect with us. Details are there in the chat box for you all. Then talking about this uh, certification offerings, uh, so certification will help you to increase your visibility, expand your knowledge and skills. Uh, we do provide certification add-ons, onboarding add-ons like short duration modules and more. Then today's training, uh, the webinar is organized and handled by the ATC community uh, as your tech community. So our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in cloud technologies. Also, we have uh, different different uh, kind of uh, communities with the relevant upcoming workshops and the webinars. We do keep on posting over there. We have emerging technology community for all. Then we have Azure Tech community Pune specifically for Pune Acres. Then we have Azure Tech community Surat and Azure Tech Community Nagpur. Uh, interested participants can go and download the Meetup app on, on your phone or on your device, and you all can go and follow us on our communities. The community links has been mentioned in the chat box for you all. Then participants uh, need to follow the conduct of this webinar, uh, you which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Uh, please note, no one is allowed to take the screenshot of the presentation and cannot do the screen recording. Uh, while the speaker is sharing his or her screen. Also, we'll try to upload this recording on our official YouTube channel. And we'll share the links with the participants, those who have attended this both the uh, both part of the webinar which is today and tomorrow will share will definitely share the attendee link with them then we have uh, miss mansi shane with us she is an mct microsoft certified trainer and currently works with synergetics as a trainer consultant agenda for this webinar you will get an overview of this certification, AZ900 certification and more. Then this is the learning plan. Uh, I will explain you all ahead in this session. And then the upcoming webinars. Yeah, you can see we have mentioned the details for the upcoming webinars. Also, we share the event page link on which we have uploaded all of this webinar. Interested participants can go and register themselves over there.
uh, for this webinar AZ900, we have we will be sharing the complementary badge with all, which includes the modules related to the topics and concepts which will be taught in the webinar. Also, you can share this badge on your LinkedIn and Twitter profile. To get the badge activated, uh, there are a few steps which you have to follow and get the badge activated. The batch details and the steps will be mentioned in the chat box. You just have to follow the steps and get your batch activated. Uh, guys, please note this batch in material. You all can go and access your study material for AZ 900 once you get the batch activated. So make sure you get the batch activated. So you all can go and revise your study for the AZ 900 to the batch. And don't forget to uh, follow us on our social media platforms. As I have earlier mentioned, we have shared the social media platforms and the community links in the chat box. Go and follow us over there to get the relevant updates on our upcoming webinars, workshops and trainings related to the certifications. Uh, I appreciate everyone for listening to me. Uh, now passing over the mic to the speaker so she can go ahead with the session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Aitali. Hello, everyone. A very good afternoon. Um, my name is Manasi Shahani, as Chaitali said, and I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. And I've been training for around uh, five years and plus in cloud technologies. So um, starting with today's webinar, OK, we are going to talk about the AZ900 certification, what it is, what does it cover, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're new to cloud, don't worry. This can this is like a starting point for you all. Just before we go ahead, I just want to know from your side, like have you ever worked on Azure? Do you have any experience on any of the cloud technologies that are there so you can just put yes i have an experience no i have an ex i don't have an experience etc if you can put it in the chat box very quickly i will uh, it will really help me in understanding what you know what because i will be explaining things from scratch that is for sure and for and you need not be from the coding background okay that is uh, not needed over here okay but as far as you are as far as the uh, as far as this topic is concerned you need to have little knowledge about computers should be little about uh, how you use a computer etc because then it will make it a little easy i'm not saying it will be uh, it's going to be difficult it will be very easy if you know a little bit about computers great so i can see not many people know okay about uh, Cloud, okay. If some of okay, great. So let's start. But before we get into the modules, I would like to give an overview of AZ nine hundred, what it is, and um, what kind of modules are we going to cover, etc. These all things is what I first want to talk about. OK, so this particular course that is the AZ 900 is a fundamental course or a basic course for people who are new to cloud, who have some knowledge of cloud. OK, it is for them. So it's like a beginner's course which starts from scratch of what is cloud? How did cloud evolve? What are the benefits of using cloud? What are the services that are there in cloud? What are the different types of cloud? What are the uh, resources that one can create in cloud, etc.? These are the things that is the objective of this training. Normally, this training is a one day training, but uh, we can also divide it into two days uh, for four hours uh, of training. And uh, like I said, you need to have a little IT background. It is kind of recommended. If, if, if you don't have, 
still it's fine it doesn't matter much but if if you have some then it play it will be a little beneficial because some concepts then are easy to understand so this course or this certification has three modules okay uh, that is co cloud concepts which will cover the basics of what is cloud and etc then we move on and focus on the public cloud or the most popular cloud that is Azure, which is a proprietary cloud of Microsoft. So we are going to see services that are specific to Azure cloud. And then third, moving more ahead into how you can manage this cloud, how you can access this cloud. Some more things on that is what we are going to focus in the last module. Now coming to the examination point of view. OK, uh, this is the percentage or this is the weightage uh, of the questions that can come in your certification. If you plan to give this certification, OK, in future, you this is what is the distribution of the modules or the the from this much module, this much percentage of questions will come. OK, this is how it is distributed, divided. And we will be seeing some sample questions tomorrow. Once we complete module three, we will be moving on to some of the sample questions. OK, actual questions that have, have come in the AZ 900 certification. Apart from this, I will be sharing a link uh, from where you can learn about the AZ 900. OK, uh, study about the Azure cloud and you can go to the sandbox. OK, majority of the labs, etc. are present in a, my in the Microsoft Learn sandbox. So I will show you all uh, this tomorrow and we will uh, learn more about this when we do the exam prep module. OK, so now. Before we uh, OK, now let's move to the first module that is we will be understanding the cloud concepts. OK, so I will be sharing my screen. OK, so we all know that Cloud is, you know, kind of uh, becoming very popular. It's something that has been there. We are seeing so many people working on cloud and etc. So before we understand actually what is cloud, let's talk about the scenario before cloud. OK, let's talk about the scenario. Before cloud. So it's not that cloud was never there. It all it was there. OK, but earlier it was a little different to what it is now. OK, have you ever heard of the term servers? So server is nothing but like a black box. OK, it was a box. OK, which provides the capabilities like an Internet. OK, so it was like a black box. OK, and on top of that you could you know, deploy or create your applications. OK, so earlier, what was the scenario? OK. Um, then I had to let's say let's talk about in terms of an example. OK, I had to create an application or an website. OK. Just one minute. Yeah, so let's say I want to deploy. Uh, an application. Or a website. OK, so normally what would happen is that we would need to, you know, and of course I'm creating an application or I'm creating a website. It's not just for me to use, right? It's for somebody else to use. So what would we normally do is that we would buy one of these servers. OK, and we would deploy that application on top of those servers because server is nothing but like a black box, a physical device that is there. 
which has the capability of you know of you know uh, you, you can deploy your application or website on top of that now why would you need a server okay so like i said it's not you who is going to consume the website use the website it is going to be used by people okay some other people like let's talk about the amazon website it's not amazon is only using it for its employees right it is available to people across the globe so now if i want to make my website available to people okay i need the capability of the server okay on that server okay or on multiple servers i would need to deploy my application or my website that i have created normally if you are a developer a developer uses the local server right we use the 127.0.0.1 and the port is some 500 the local host right that is the server that we use let's say you don't want to use on that server you have to now put it to production okay you have to scale out your website make it available to other people so you can't use the development server over there you need some other servers okay so earlier what would happen is that companies would actually buy servers okay they would have a room full of servers room full i mean still if there are big organizations they still have this servers it is not everything has been put into cloud okay they still have every all i mean they still have a room where servers are still deployed okay they are not using any of the public cloud or any of the cloud service providers as of yet okay there are still rooms full of these black boxes okay so what is the job of these black boxes basically it, they will have the database of your organization they can have the websites of your organization okay but what is this this is nothing but the as somebody has rightly put it in the chat it is nothing but the data center that is there okay so if i have my own data center if i have a room full of servers okay which i have bought okay which i have bought which i am now going to maintain now let's talk about it like you have okay you the company is brought the servers okay they could purchase it okay normally servers are uh, they cost a lot so it is very expensive to purchase or procure so big companies can afford it but what if it's a startup okay so a startup normally can't afford unless you get that investment okay so let's say you have bought those servers you have made a room okay but these servers that are there okay now like i said you have to put them into production okay you have procured or bought the servers okay now once you have put everything into place servers have been you know put into a room you've deployed your application or whatever you want to database is up and running etc etc your work doesn't stop there okay the server since you need to keep them on 24 7 365 days because you can't afford to have your website down now you know google i think in or whatsapp I, I, or facebook sorry meta you know some months ago their entire server was down okay whatsapp was not working instagram was not working facebook was not working so what happened they incurred millions of losses even though the servers were down for 2 hours or 1 hour etc so you can understand the severity that is there that requires your servers to be up and running so you can't afford to have your servers down okay so you need to maintain those servers you need to have a team dedicated to maintain the servers and of course this team is going to be there even after you have purchased the servers like i said your job doesn't end there right you need to have a team who will take care of these servers who will maintain it okay and this team will of course not work free 
right? You will have to pay salaries to these um, team members who are maintaining, right? So there also you are incurring a cost. Okay, okay. It's up till now. Big companies can do this. They can procure servers. They can hire a team, etc. But what if it's a startup? What if it's a startup? Do you think they can afford any of it? Okay. Let's say they get that initial investment also. No worries. But now you okay. Let's say they have money to buy the servers. They hired a team also, etc. They can still afford, but there will be a cost that will be always there. Okay, now the servers that we have installed tend to become very hot. Okay, they are going to heat up. Why they are going to heat up? Because they are going to be running 24-7, 365 days. Like I said, you can't afford to uh, have your website down, not available to the customers, right? You can't afford that. You incur millions of losses. So now your servers have to be running 24-7. So when they are running, okay, they tend to heat up a lot. So in order to cool them down, we need to install air conditioners. We need to in, we need to install cooling units. OK, so that cost is also there. Once you install ACs, you install some cooling units. OK, you need power. Right, you will need power or electricity in order to run those ACs, even run the servers. You need electricity, right? Do you think the cost of electricity is going to go down ever? Don't you think it will keep on? It will charge you month on month. There is going to be a cost of electricity or power that will be applied to you. Why? Because your servers are running, your cooling units are running. So that cost, who's going to manage that cost? And that cost is going to be monthly, right? Depending on how much you're using. So again, purchasing cooling units. Paying for the paying for the power. OK, all these things. OK, but. Are the challenges that normally. Or let's say were the was the scenario before cloud came into picture. If I had to deploy an application, I had to deploy my own website, make it available to customers across the globe. OK. I had to first of all purchase servers. I had to create a team who would maintain these servers. OK, and of course, then purchase cooling units like ACs, pay for the electricity. OK, because like I said, you need your servers to be running. So this cost. OK, or this um, expenditure. OK, that you are spending in order to set up the infrastructure. OK, this is called as the physical infrastructure in terms of cloud. So the cost or, or the expenditure that is incurred in order to uh, set up the infrastructure is called as CapEx. So what is CapEx? The cost or let's put it as initial cost incurred. OK, in order to set up. The physical. Infrastructure now, what do I mean by physical infrastructure? Get the servers, buy the cooling units, dedicate a room, OK, etc. This all things come under the physical infrastructure and the cost that you have is called as the capex. The cost that you incur over here is called as the capex or the capital expenditure. OK, and the process or like I said, you could set your set up your own room full of servers OK, hire a team, maintain it, etc. So that kind of a cloud, OK, that kind of a process in terms of cloud is called as the. Private cloud or on premise. 
cloud. Now, what is this? This means this is something that is private to an enterprise. It is not available to people outside. It is not something that is made public. It is something that is used by the enterprise employees, by the organization only. OK, it's not available to the people outside that particular organization. So this particular cloud is called as the private or the end on premise cloud. Clear? OK, so. The capex, like I said, this is the initial cost. OK, so once you set up everything, then you will not have capex. But like I said, you need to pay the salaries of the employees, right? You need to pay the electricity bill, correct? You need to uh, maintain that, maintain the servers, okay? So the cost that you incur, even after the physical infrastructure has been set up, okay? In order to keep your cloud operational, okay? In order to keep it operational, that kind of a cost is called as the OPEX or the operational expenditure. Okay, what is this cost? This is the cost that will always be there. Okay, it will not go away. Right, why? Because are you going to not pay the electricity bill? If you don't pay the electricity bill, you know, right? We will not be receiving any electricity. My servers will not be running. I will not be able to make my website available to people. OK, it's not that you cannot pay the electricity bill or what if your ACs are down? Which AC is down? How do I monitor these things? How do I maintain these things? OK, I need to pay the appropriate people. Then only my servers will be operational. So the cost incurred. In order to. Keep your physical infrastructure operational is the operational expenditure or the OPEX. Okay, so now coming back again to the scenario before cloud, like I said, you need to have your own servers, you need to purchase them, procure them. OK, you need to have a team dedicated to it, purchase cooling units, etc. Pay for the electricity. One second. Yeah, so this is the cost that you would Incur. Now coming back to the scenario before cloud. So like. To have all of these things, then only you can have your own cloud. OK, but now. Let, I uh, like this is like for a big company. This is nothing. They, they have the capital. They even have the OPEX so they can set up their own private cloud or on premise cloud. That is fine for them. But what if it's a startup? Do you think they will be able to afford any of this? Initially, OK, let's say even capital is there, but what if once the capital is gone? What about the operational cost? They will raise funds, but till when? How long are you going to keep on raising? It's not that it's going to be down. Right? So if and what if they don't even get funding? There can be chances. There are very little funding which is not even which can't even meet the need of the capex. They can't even purchase servers. What if that is also the problem? OK, another challenge that is there. OK, now OK, even the, if you could deploy an application, you could deploy a website, maintain a database, etc. You could do that. That is fine. But what? how do you predict that at this point, my servers are going to be utilized the maximum? And at this point, my servers are not going to be used at all. Meaning, let's say you have a website that you have deployed, OK, which is uh, an e-commerce website, OK, for example. And 
now we have the holiday season coming let's say uh, diwali went okay i'm just giving an example diwali was long ago okay but uh diwali went so during that time my uh, website had a lot of traffic a lot of people were coming to my website they were shopping they were purchasing things okay they were even just browsing across okay but there was traffic my website was being utilized okay so this was during the high peak i mean during the festive season so what was happening there was a high load there was a load on my servers in order to meet the demands of my customers okay right now let's say it is not a any festival is not around the corner and there are very few people who are coming and visiting my website okay hardly i am able to hardly there are 10 customers who are visiting my website so let's say you have around 20 servers okay during the festive season these 20 servers were fully occupied okay they were being utilized the maximum okay there was no problem for me i could manage okay but what if let's say these 20 servers could only manage 100 customers guys i'm just giving a rough number it is just something that i'm doing okay it's just rough estimation just to explain the concept to you all okay so 20 servers that means per server only 5 customers were being managed what if now the count instead of 100 customers went to a more went to like uh i mean 10000 customers i'm just giving a rough number then what will happen these 20 servers who were only managing 5 customers will have so much load on them okay some customers might lose you might lose some of those customers out of those 10000 because these 20 customers 20 servers couldn't manage those customers the incoming traffic okay so this is what this is the high peak that you had achieved let's say there is no there is no customer coming it's a week day and there are on a daily basis only 10 customers are visiting your website so what will your servers do in this this time so here they were being utilized to the maximum but reverse the situation they are not being utilized now so don't you think they will become idle okay let's say now i have only 10 customers so one server can also manage the 10 i mean the 10 customers why do i need the remaining 19 servers then how do i decide this how do i predict that okay uh at this particular point i am going to have these many customers at this particular point i'm not going to have these many customers okay how do i come to know that i have to you know that i have so much demand on this day and i don't have any demand on this day how do i do this planning and if i have even if i have to install a server okay it's not a day it doesn't take you know a few hours it takes a day or two to install new servers in order to manage your load okay so of course in that period you are going to lose more customers again a loss for you right so how do i manage this on demand provisioning of servers how do i manage this high and ideal peak load okay of servers so these were the challenges these were the problems that were there or one would face when or before before the cloud came into picture so cloud said okay don't worry i will take care i'll do one thing i will provide the so so cloud said okay i will buy the i will buy the servers i will maintain it i will do everything for it okay you do one thing you just okay pay for what you are using you just pay for what you are 
using. Rest everything I will take care of. You want to deploy your website? Go ahead. I will manage the servers. You want to create the databases? Go ahead. Do that. I will manage the backend. Okay. Just pay for what you're using and how long are you using? So it's like your electricity bill. Like if you're not using any of the appliances at your house, okay, uh, except for the fridge that is there. Okay, your AC is you're not using, you're not switching on the fans. Let's say it's the winter season that is going on. So you no, do not require ACs, fans. Okay. So what will happen automatically? Your electricity bill will come down, right? It will not be so high. And contrary to the summer season where you have your ACs, fans, every all the appliances that are there running. OK, so of course your electricity bill is going to go high. So what you do? So whatever you're using, OK, you're paying for it, right? It's not that you have been you're you're not using AC and you've been charged for it. OK, you're uh, you know, and AC consumes a lot of electricity, a lot of power is required. So if you're not using AC and you see that you're being billed for no reason. OK, so of course, then you will go and question the authorities. But here it's the same thing. If you're not using anything, you will not be billed. But if you are using it and OK, and how long you're using it will all be asked and you will have to pay for that as well. OK, so this is what cloud said. I will take care of everything. OK, I will take care of the physical infrastructure that is there. You just pay for what you're using. OK, so what happened? We talked about the on demand provisioning. OK, so whenever I need servers, I can ask cloud. Please give me these many servers. OK, and once I am done using the servers, I just have to give it back. OK, I have to release those servers. OK, and and then pay for how much I for how long and how many servers have I used. I just need to pay for that. So that is called as elasticity and not scalability. It is called as elasticity. OK, this is nothing but the on demand. Provisioning. of servers i will talk about the difference between the two when we come when we come to the benefits of cloud okay so this was the scenario that was there so now what will happen startups it is easy for them they don't have to worry about the cost raising funds okay capital they don't have to raise anything they just need some money in order to pay for the servers that they are renting OK, the other term that you can use instead of on demand provisioning or paying what you are calling what I'm saying, OK, pay for what you're using is nothing but the rent that you are going to pay. OK, in order to uh, provision servers, use the physical infrastructure of cloud. OK, so. When cloud says, OK, you use my physical infrastructure, take servers that you need from me. OK, I will do that. I will maintain the team. I will have a pooling unit, etc. All of that I will take care. OK, you just use my use my resources that I have. So this kind of a cloud. Is called as the public cloud, OK, which means it is available to the public in order to use OK. Without worrying about the capital, without worrying about the physical infrastructure, just paying or yeah, just paying for what they are using. OK, uh, this is what the public cloud is. OK, and the one who provides this public cloud. OK, the ones who provide this public cloud are called as cloud service providers. Or short forms, short form is CSPs. OK, this. Is uh, these are the ones who are responsible to provide the cloud. For example, you have Microsoft, you have Amazon, you have Google. OK, and they provide the public cloud, which are popularly called as Microsoft, Azure, AWS, 
Amazon Web Service. Okay. Then Google, nothing but Google Cloud Platform, that is GCP. Okay. These are the ones who provide the cloud. And that cloud that they provide is called as the public cloud, which is available to the public. Okay, so Microsoft, Azure, AWS, GCP, they are nothing but the three most popular clouds out there. Okay, there are many, but the, these are the three most popularly used and AWS is becoming more popular nowadays. Okay, so let's say, I want to use the combination of two. Okay. I want some capabilities. I have a private cloud. Okay. I have some services uh, deployed on the servers in my private cloud. But I also want the instead of you know adding more infrastructure at my on-premise or private cloud, what I can do is I can just procure some servers from the public cloud. Okay, so if I am doing a combination of the two, I'm using the capabilities of the private cloud and the public cloud. That kind of a cloud is called as the hybrid cloud. Okay, it is nothing but the private cloud plus the public cloud. So let's say for like how you, if somebody has a wedding at their house and we know at weddings, lots of guests come in, okay. So some guests you are managing at home, meaning uh, making arrangements for them to stay at home. So that kind of becomes like a private cloud. Okay. But some guests you are accommodating in a nearby hotel. Okay. You have booked some rooms for them to stay. So you are instead of using whatever is at your house. Okay. You are you using the capability of the hotel. Okay. Which becomes your public cloud. So some resources you're managing at the public cloud and some resources you're managing at the private cloud. So this combination is called as the hybrid cloud, but hybrid cloud is a little expensive. You need to have an appropriate license, okay? Or you need to uh, be eligible in order to use the hybrid cloud, okay? Or uh, in, in any of these services that are there. OK, so this is what is the three types of cloud that we have. That is the private, public and the hybrid. This was the scenario that was there before cloud came in. So like I said, since public cloud came in, it took over all the physical infrastructure. It said, please, just what you need is a good Internet connectivity and you can easily deploy any of the services that you want, whether it's an app, it's a website, it's a database, it's a storage account, it's a virtual machine. OK, you can do that easily if you have the money and you have a good Internet connectivity. OK, so this is what is cloud. So cloud computing. Is nothing but. Creating or deploying services over the internet and having the flexibility okay to stop the service delete the service etc like i said the on demand provisioning okay that is nothing but is the cloud computing okay so now let's see certain uh, benefits of using cloud So we kind of get this. We saw this. So this is what is cloud computing. Then the most popular cloud out there, Microsoft Azure. OK, what it is and why should one. Uh, Chaitali, can you confirm whether you can see my screen or not? Chaitali, Archie, anyone? Okay, so if you can't see my screen, uh, please log in and log out. I mean, log in again. Okay. So why use Azure? 
Okay, uh, first, I mean, we will be listing things around. I will be listing okay. things. I will be listing out some examples, some things that, you know, will, uh, will, you know, and of course, towards the end, that is tomorrow, I'll do a quick comparison between Amazon and, I mean, AWS as your, okay, why you should, which cloud should you go with? And if you are a, uh, some, and if you're someone who is new to this particular cloud, then which one to go with? Okay. So as your, like I said, it's a public cloud. It is something that is proprietary to Microsoft. Okay. And uh, it is a very vibrant platform. Trust me, like I've been using Azure for a couple of years and the interface that it has, the way one can use, it's super, super easy. Okay. Very easy to even learn this particular cloud. It's not rocket science. Okay. Because Microsoft has really made it very easy for us to use it. Okay, so this is the Azure platform that is there. You can see the numbers speak for it. Okay, you can see the number of customers Azure already has, and most of them are listed in the Fortune 500 companies. Okay, so these are the list of some of the companies that use uh, Microsoft Azure Cloud. Then we will be talking about this concept, and so. We, when we talk about high availability, when I spoke about your service being available, okay, you can't afford it to be down for any moment. Okay, why is it highly available, etc.? We will be seeing that in some time. Okay, so when as when you're talking about Azure, Azure has a global presence. Okay, it is present across 60 plus regions you can see okay there are multiple regions where you can find azure okay so you can see how globally it is spread and how you can make your service highly available we will be seeing this thing shortly then amazon i don't know how much services i mean how many regions they have i'm not that familiar with it okay but yeah if you're working on azure there are lots of services okay it's not just uh, something that is proprietary to microsoft okay uh, like a, like sql server or um, Or machine learning, etc. It also has third party releases. Like, for example, if you want to use Azure, op I mean, if you want to use OpenAI, you know, we have OpenAI, which has become very popular nowadays, right? So, if you have a Azure account, Azure subscription, okay, using that, you can definitely um, get the OpenAI uh, models that are there, whether it is chat. Uh, GPT, whether it is Dal E, whether it is um, some other, I think Whisper or something, I'm not sure. But all those models that are there, they are also available uh, in the Azure platform. So if you have an Azure subscription, okay, you can use those services as well. And not just OpenAI, even Databricks. Okay, so if you are familiar with Databricks, something that is a big data analysis tool okay um that is also available if you have the azure subscription or access to the azure cloud okay so you can it's not just specific to microsoft of course there are multiple third party services and they are released upgraded on a frequent basis so it's not that it is something that is a older version it, that, those also services are updated on the Azure platform. Okay, so now coming to the benefits of um, cloud, just one minute. Okay, so talking about cloud benefits, the first benefit is the high availability. So what is high availability? 
so like i said we don't like our services or websites you know to be down for any second we want things at this very moment right it's not that we want things to come after one hour okay i have i've logged into a website and the website is coming after an hour we don't want that right we want the service to be highly available okay so how does azure or cloud make it highly available so let's just talk about this though this concept is going to come was going to come later uh, let's uh, talk about it now okay so i'll be resharing just a minute Uh, I think you are the only one who is facing the issue uh, and we are not going to be sharing the slides. So I would recommend you check your internet connectivity because most of them can see um, my screen. OK, but as of now, I'm not sharing anything. But uh, if you are facing any problem, I would recommend that you go and check your internet because I can uh, my team has confirmed that they can see my screen. OK, so I'm going to go and. Touch paint. So when we, you know, deploy a service in Azure, OK, or create a service in Azure, OK, um, it is normally. Deployed or created, OK, in the in a specific region okay it is deployed in a specific region now what is this region okay so a region and we saw earlier that azure has some 60 plus regions right where you can deploy your services okay so this region that is there OK, it's nothing but a geographic. Location. On Earth, I mean, it's actual location that is there. OK, any city and or an, any region. OK, is like an actual geographic location on Earth. OK, I'm not sharing my presentations. I am uh, working on paint as of now. So. When I say I'm deploying an application, OK, um, creating an application. So whenever you create one, OK, whether we are creating a virtual machine, we are creating a storage account, we are creating a database, which we will see later. OK, uh, it is normally deployed in a region. OK, it is normally deployed in a region. So now, like I said, region is nothing but a geographic location, a physical location on earth okay it can be in a country okay it can be a country or part of a country okay so that is what is basically a region okay so a region is something like a geographic location so this is like a region so this is your region OK, and when I deploy a service in a region, normally a region has three things, uh, has 
okay, is divided in something called as availability zones. Is create or has something called as the availability zone. Okay, and inside a region, there are always three availability zones. Okay, there are going to be always three availability zones. So before we talk about the this availability zone and region a little in depth, uh, let's let's say I have a region. Okay, let's say this is my region. Okay, and I have an uh, data center. Okay, so a data center is like a building full of servers. This is what we had talked about. OK, so this is let's say I have an application and I am deploying it. OK. In the London region, OK, I'm putting it across London. OK. I am putting it across London and inside the London region, I have a data center. OK, let's say this is a data center and inside the data center. So a data center is like a building. OK, full of servers. So it has something called as. Racks, OK, these are called as. Racks, OK, which have multiple servers across them. How a building has floors. Right, exactly the same way a server or sorry, a data center has floors of servers so that they can have a lot of servers onto them. OK, so let's say I have a website that I have created and I have deployed it on my data center, which is present in the London region. OK, it's present in the London region, so people who are living in London, OK, for them, this particular website that is there, it is easily available. Okay, it is easily available to them. Okay, but now what is the challenge? Let's say for some reason, okay, for some reason, this data center that I have goes down or crashes. Let's say, like I said, servers, we need electricity, right? Let's say there is no power or for some reason there is a natural calamity like flood or earthquake, etc. Something has occurred. OK, so. Because of these reasons uh, for because of these reasons, OK, my data center has gone down. So what do you do? Let's say it's, this is in one part of London. OK, in London itself. So what will happen now is that the application or the website that you have created will no longer be available to the people who are in London. OK, why? Because you had only one copy. OK, you had only this particular place where your website was stored OK, or or deployed. OK, now you don't have an copy or you don't have access to that website. So again, you'll lose millions and millions of money. OK, so now what do you do? OK, so like I said, this is in one part of London. Let's say you create another. Uh, copy. Of your website. In another location in London. OK, it's the same thing you do. You create a copy. OK, so this is also. In London. Region. Here, yeah. so now what happens in case this goes down, this data center goes down. What will happen is your website now still available to the customers in London? Yes, guys, if this. Website 
that you have created, you have deployed in one of the data centers in the London region, be accessible to people in the London region? Yes or no? Even if this data center is no longer available, will my website be available? What do you think? Will it be available to the people? Why do you think so? This data center is working fine. I've created, I've just deployed this to another this thing. So why do you think it will not work? So what, what I have done, instead of one region, I have made a copy, I have deployed a copy of my website to another region. So what will happen now? In case this data center goes down, I still have my website up and running. So this is what is called as high availability. Okay, if you have, okay, your website, another copy of it or whatever, in case any of the servers goes down, you have a copy, okay, of your website that you have created in another region. OK, or yeah, in or in the same region, we will talk about the region concept. OK, then your data. Is highly available or your service is highly available. OK, now let's say I am in Mumbai. OK, and I want to access this website that somebody has created who has deployed it in the London region. OK, I want to access this particular website. Do you think I will be able to access the website? Do you think it will be easy for me to access the website? There will be no latency at all, no delay. In it, the moment I say, uh, okay, the moment I say www.example.com, okay, I can access the website. Yes, you guys are right. I will be able to access it, but do you think at that very moment, I will get the website. I'll type www.example.com. Do you think I will get the website immediately available? So if I am in Mumbai and my website is deployed in the London region, OK, I can access it. There is no doubt about it. I can access it, but there will be a latency or delay in accessing or uh, you know making the website highly available to me there will be a delay right so even if you deploy it in one region they will be only available to the london customers what about people who are accessing from mumbai or even from new york what about them so not just in london but you can even deploy it to some other region. So probably in Mumbai. So what will happen? So the same website you come, you deploy it in the Mumbai region. So what will happen? That you are being saved from any natural, uh, natural calamity, data center going down. OK, and apart from that, even if people who are working or accessing the website and are residing in Mumbai, they can also access it. Yeah, so you can make a copy and you can store it. So that people in Mumbai can access your website. Yeah, so now people in London can also access people in Mumbai can also access your website. So you have solved two problems. You have solved what you have solved. The in case of a calamity, natural disaster, you make or you deploy it to another region to another same thing. I mean, within the same region, but to another part. OK, and if you want it to be. Globally accessible, you can put it into that specific region so that there is not much latency at it, uh, there's not much delay experience. OK, so when we talk about an Azure region. 
an azure region like i said is divided into availability zones so these availability zones that you see okay is nothing but that provides the high availability to your services okay and in a region it is there are only three availability zones not more than that and high availability is something that is in your hand okay it is something that you need to configure it is up to you you decide how highly available you want okay so it is up to you or how you want to make your data available in terms of storage when we see Okay, it is up to your hand. So a region is nothing but a geographic location and it is divided into three availability zones. These availability zones are linked together. Through low latency fiber optics. OK, so these availability zones have their own independent cooling units, networking towers. OK, they are all three independent. OK, they in case one goes down. In case one goes down, you can put it into the other two availability zones. So this is how Azure or any cloud service that is there makes your service highly available so if you use cloud a public cloud you get the benefit of high availability but of course this is in your hand okay there is a concept called as sla okay the higher you pay the more availability are you going to get okay so it's that so sla is like a service level agreement that you make with azure OK, that if I provide you this much percentage of high availability, so it goes from 99.99 depends on the nines that are there after the decimal. OK, the percentage I will provide you, let's say only six seconds downtime. OK, so it's like a mutual understanding that is there between Azure and you. OK, so if you want this much high availability from Azure, it will give you this much downtime. But of course, terms and conditions applied, you need to pay that much. So you don't have this in the syllabus. I've just given it as example. OK, but availability, like I said, is in your hands. OK, you need to pay in order to get that much. You need to shell out money in order to get that much high availability that is there. So that's that's what I said. You need to configure those things. You need to decide, okay, like if in case you need to have a plan ready, you know, in that situation, then that is how it is. Like I said, you have to configure it. As your job is to give you that high availability, okay? Like whenever you're creating a VM, I will show you all. It is in your hand how you manage that high availability that is there. Okay, so. And of course, like I said, they are all interlinked. OK, so there are people who are deployed, who are managing your these regions. It's not left alone. There are people who, of course, will be handling this region. So they, uh, they will come to know about it ultimately, right? And automatically the process does take place. And like I said, if it is a natural calamity or something like a war also going on, OK, it is not your fault. Okay, if you're residing in another country and you happen to deploy your services in uh, some other region, like I, when I work on Azure, there is a region called as East US. I deploy my services only to that region. Why do I do it? Is because a cost is very low of the services, so that is also, uh, yes, there is only a limit of three, not more than three availability zones are there in a region. OK, there are only three availability zones. So like I said, I was I, like I was saying when I create services, I always create it in the East US region because cost is a big, big, big factor. And this we will see tomorrow. OK, uh, since I am a Microsoft certified trainer, I get some 
only 7000 rupees on a monthly basis okay to use the azure cloud okay and in that 7000 i have to manage big services okay like uh we are talking about Azure Synapse. We are talking about data breaks, machine learning, all those things I need to use and they are very cost intensive. They charge you a lot for that. It's not like a storage account or a VM that you are creating. OK, those are big services and they charge a lot. Databases cost a lot. OK, so you have to judicially manage that cost. So those are the factors that are also there. So you might be thinking, why do you deploy it in East US? Yes, I do face latency, etc. But cost is what matters to me as of now. OK, so that is why I always deploy my services over there. So this is how uh, your Azure region is basically divided. And this is how it provides high availability to the customers okay then coming to the next point that is elasticity so elasticity we have already seen how it provides elasticity okay and you have another concept called as scalability so scalability is again you know, uh, lo allocating resources, okay, resources meaning the physical compute, okay, memory, input output devices, okay, which disk to use for memory, okay, whether it I should keep it up SSD or a HDD, okay, all those things come in the scalability. So it's like a physical compute of the uh, servers that are there that you decide. OK, so scalability is something that in that is in your hand. OK, you can configure it. OK, it is again something that can increase, decrease, but depending on what you have configured. OK, so scalability is again. Of types, either you scale in or you scale out. Now scaling in meaning um, you uh, uh, let's talk about uh, scaling out. So scaling out is also called as horizontal scaling. OK, so you are. Uh, I'll actually divide it. I'll actually show it to you all. Just give me one minute. Let me share. Let me just show it through the through visuals only. I do one thing. So let's say I have a server. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead with this. So normally when we talk about a server, okay, so a server has physical requirements, right? It has physical uh, resources that you need. That is memory. OK, so memory. How many IOs or input output devices that you will need? OK. CPUs or we call it as V uh, V cores. OK, the computing power that is there. So all these things are something that form a part of scalability. OK, and this is something that you can configure, you can decide. OK, so when I talk about scalability. OK, so scalability is. So scalability, you can kind of 
divided into or let's say um you have horizontal scalability okay so this horizontal scalability has either scaling out or scaling in okay so what is this so it has two types again for the scaling in or scaling out and the other is scaling in And then you have another type that is vertical scalability. And vertical scalability again has two types that is scale up, and you have scale down. Now, talking about the horizontal scalability. Okay, so when you create a or configure a server, okay, so instead of, or let me talk about first vertical scalability, okay. So, vertical scalability means if you are increasing the capability of one server of the same or number of servers that you have okay instead of adding another server okay in the in 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 you know another server to this if you are increasing the capability of this server itself okay Okay, if you are increasing the capability, meaning increasing the memory, increasing the V cores that are surround that are going to be there, the CPU that is there, the computing units, okay, the input output devices it can take. So that process, if you're going up or down, is called as the vertical scalability. Okay, but of the same resource. Okay, so the same machine you're upgrading to uh, manage more uh you know handle more of your load then that is called as vertical scalability okay the other scalability is that you keep the same machine okay you don't scale it or scale uh, scale down okay depending on the workload that is there okay so either you can scale up or you can scale down over here OK, the other thing is the horizontal scalability. So horizontal scalability, you keep this machine as it is. And to this, OK, you add another machine. OK, so you. Just take the same thing, same configuration and add this machine to your set of servers. So what you are doing, you're going in a horizontal direction instead of increasing the same machine. Okay, so you're increasing the computing power. So that means you're going in a horizontal direction. So this means you're scaling out. But let's say you don't want the other machines. Okay, you don't want multiple machines. So you're reducing the computing power. Then that becomes the scaling in. You're coming back to one machine depending on your load. So this all depends on the load that you have. OK, depends on how much traffic you are generating. I mean, your website is generating all this. Like I said, scalability is something you configure. You decide upon the load that you have. OK, whereas elasticity is something that is taken care by the cloud. 
okay all these things you decide you you feel okay this is where i feel the load will increase this is what will happen okay so you configure the scalability okay but you config but elasticity is something that is dynamic okay it is something that is done by the cloud service provider okay so this is what is the difference between scalability and elasticity so both you get the benefit of both it's not that just elasticity and you're left hanging that okay now my cloud service provider will increase the computing power etc he will decide what will go in the servers but if you want that flexibility then go with scalability okay now coming to the next benefit that is reliability so reliability you need to make your uh, so vertical scaling is either you go up or down you decide whether uh, you want to increase the computing power of the same machine okay you can go up that is uh, scaling up or once that is done you can scale down okay you can reduce the computing power depending on your need so if you go up or down that is called as the vertical scaling so now coming to the next concept that is reliability that depends it depends on your uh, need like how do you want it okay and depends on the load that you are experiencing okay so when you are going with an app service or deploying a website uh, generally it is up to you okay uh, you can decide how you want to balance that out okay uh, whether you want like if a traffic on the website is more than 70% so you can add another load i mean add another machine so rest of the 30% will be managed by that machine okay whereas if the compute or if the traffic is less than 30% then you can bring it down to one machine okay it is up to you it is depending on what is your uh, requirement okay then coming to reliability you need to make your services highly reliable i mean you need us uh, or cloud needs to provide reliability it's not that it uh, you know you have deployed a service and uh, there is nothing i mean there is a lot of bugs lot of security issues okay so you need to make your cloud needs to make the service reliable okay it has to also help you or it provides the benefit of predictability now what is predictability like i said uh, i talked about cost so cost is an important factor that is there and um, if you want to you know predict how much is a particular service going to cost you okay how much is it going to charge you so you can do that using the predictability benefit of cloud okay so that is what is the benefit predictability then security of course we know today security is so important we have a entire service okay entire certification in microsoft which concentrates on security and security only okay that is the sc series that chaitali uh, talked about uh, before the session started so security is very critical we all know so we are going to so microsoft has certain services that it provides in order to make your uh, resources that you have deployed whether it's a virtual machine it's a um, database it's a storage account to make it highly secure okay so that's the benefit that you have otherwise when you are in the private cloud everything okay all the uh, security and everything is under your control so when you shift to the public cloud you don't have to worry about all of this you just have to deploy the service and done secure uh, you know configure the security whatever you need according to the money that you have okay all of these things do cost okay so depending on that you decide and you manage so this is a benefit that it brings and then lastly second last is the governance so like i said azure is present in 60 plus regions right it is spread across so many regions okay in us in uk in germany in australia okay and these countries have their own different governing standards 
okay or we call it as data protection standards because ultimately when you create a service you're giving up your data you're giving up something called as the active directory or microsoft enter id okay you are giving your information along with it okay or your if you've created a website people are coming to the website they are giving their private information right so we need to protect that data and in order to do that every government has their own policies has their own regulations that it follows okay so microsoft sticks to it okay it says okay hello i'm going to follow their standards and who does that is there is a separate tool for that okay it is called as microsoft uh, compliance we will see later tomorrow okay so governance is a entire again an entire topic okay it comes under sc which is nothing but security compliance so hence the name uh, sc okay so compliance is a part of so you need to comply with the governments right in order because you're going to be using their regions you're going to be working in their region so you need to follow their regulations their policies so who does take care of that is the cloud okay so cloud provides you that benefit okay and lastly that is manageability now what is manageability like i said at the very beginning if you are not familiar with cloud okay you don't come from an it background no worries okay anyone who is who is willing to learn cloud can do it okay and that is done because it has a benefit of manageability okay we it has its own website called as portal.azure.com okay which is like a ui tool where people can come in and create resources create vms create storage accounts create databases etc okay with just click of buttons okay and if even if you don't want the ui interface you can manage your resources or create resources if you know one of the command line interfaces okay the programming language know how to write rest apis okay so there are different ways in which you can manage your cloud and that benefit is brought brought by the if you put your services on cloud so it's not just one way ui is user interface okay like how it makes it easy for people to use okay so that is what is ui interface so it's like um like how you have instagram or facebook where it is easy to use it right so similarly if you want to use the azure cloud okay you have um scalability is something that you configure scalability is something that you configure whereas elasticity is not in your hand it is dynamic and it is taken care by the cloud service provider this is what is the difference between the two both where you allocate resources resources are being there you servers are being created but scalability you decide okay i will need this much machines i need to configure this whereas elasticity is not in your hand it is at the back end working ui is the okay the name portal.azure.com i will be showing you all that okay what it is give me some time let me just finish module 1 and then uh we when we go on to module 2 i will uh, talk about that ui uh, interface that is there then we saw this what is the difference between the two so azure uses a consumption based model and a pay as you go model so whatever you consume you need to pay for it okay so this is what is the model behind azure cloud service or any of the cloud service that is there so we have already seen this we have seen what is public cloud we have seen private cloud we have seen hybrid this is nothing but the difference between the three so these are the different clouds that are there in azure okay uh, or in any of the cloud platforms if even aws will have this gcp will have this so this is a cloud concept for all the cloud service providers or public cloud that is there okay 
then coming to the different services that are there on azure the first service that is there is called as the infrastructure as a service or iaas okay so what is this so let's say you want the full flexibility okay in terms of physical infrastructure okay so when normally when you are deploying a website or creating an app or deploying an application okay so normally what happens is that um at the back end okay you have the operating system you need memory you need uh, the all those uh, operating you need to patch the os you need to um have some uh, hypervisor etc all these things you need to put right when you are deploying a website all of this kind of needs to be a part of that so when you create a service or you deploy a service okay you are deploying it in a region in azure okay uh, chaitali if you're there can you confirm if you can see my screen or not chaitali arji anyone who's there yes yes manasi we can okay so uh, guys if you can't see the screen uh, uh, please check your internet okay um so coming back to this concept okay um uh, when i say i want to decide on uh i want to you know decide the os i want to configure the memory that i will require i don't want the azure or the cloud service provider to decide for me okay i want to have the full flexibility okay of that service that i am going to create if i want that normally because when we create an application okay whether it's a database or it's a storage account or etc or even app service okay all these services that we will create okay this is normally the cloud service provider takes care of the virtual machine takes care of what operating system to use okay which we normally can't see okay but if i want that flexibility i want to decide what operating system i need how much memory do i need okay what kind of a networking or security protocols i want to apply okay that kind of a service is called as the infrastructure as a service so it is something that no it is not same as platform as a service it is different here you get the flexibility to decide so i'll rather than this i will show you all this screen okay so if i'm talking about ias so you get the full flexibility of deciding the operating systems uh, chaitali can you see my presentation chaitali or archi both of you all can confirm yes the presentation is visible right yeah okay so uh, when we are talking about ias okay there is a responsibility that you have okay when we are talking about at the data center level okay when we are talking about at the data center level or at the uh, cloud side the physical requirements of the physical infrastructure at the physical level like i said you have a data center you have servers inside that data center okay so the server on top of that you're running your application or your website or even a database or vms or for that matter even the uh, uh, storage account whatever you have you're running on top of that server so as far as the physical requirements or the physical infrastructure is concerned at the data center level if you can't see please i would recommend check your internet connectivity log in log out and come back and see okay because others can see it see it okay so when you are talking about the physical infrastructure uh, requirements that is taken care by the cloud service provider okay at the region okay but if i want flexibility on top of that 
okay like what operating system i want what kind of applications i'm going to create whether i want a python application java application to be you know put in okay uh, or let's say if i want to manage the network okay which ip addresses should i allow which ip addresses i shouldn't allow okay all that flexibility if i want what kind of data should come in okay etc etc if i want to manage i want full liberty then that kind of a service is called as infrastructure as a service but only at the physical site okay only at the physical end of my data center will be taken care by the cloud service provider otherwise everything will be managed by me so that kind of a service is called as ias let's say i don't even want to manage or you know decide what operating system i want i just want to create one application okay i just want to just uh, start working start using the application put in my data configure the application enter my credentials and start working with it so that kind of a service is called as platform as a service where you are using the platform given to you all you are doing is you are just deciding what data you want to put in okay who should get from where should i access it okay what kind of identity who should i give or what kind of accounts do i create on top of it okay all that if i want to do okay i can do that using the platform as a service i don't want to know what operating system is being used what kind of memory is being used i don't want to know Okay, so normally when we create or deploy a website application, you kind of put it onto the. You need a operating system. You need a hypervisor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You need containers, right? And then you can kind of deploy an application. Let's say I don't want to do that. I don't want to configure it. I want Azure to do it for me. I want the cloud service provider to do it for me. Then that kind. Of, all I'm doing is I'm using the platform given to me. ready made platform given to me and then on top of that i will create applications configure the application that is there that kind of a service is called as platform as a service clear now let's say i don't want to do any of that also i want the responsibility to be taken by the cloud service provider then in that situation the type of service is called as software as a service and a classic example of software as a service is your microsoft 365 in microsoft 365 what do you do you just need to purchase the license right e3 or e5 or one of those licenses okay i've just given two examples there are many more licenses to it but you need to purchase the license and once you have the license you can automatically download the ready applications or use the applications on the web on your mobiles right you just need to download it and done and you can use word you can use powerpoint you can use excel you can use whatever applications are present in that particular service so that is called as a software as a service so consider i like to call this thing you know as pizza as a service now what do i mean by pizza as a service so let's say you're making pizza from scratch okay you're managing you're getting the ingredients to make the dough you're getting the ingredients to make the sauce you're making the base of the pizza at home you are deciding how much size or how big should your pizza be what kind of a sauce you are making whether it's tomato based or uh, it's a basil sauce okay using the basil leaves you're kind of creating the sauce okay what kind of beverages do you want to drink with the pizza okay where are you going to bake the pizza okay whether it's in the oven it's in a wooden fire etc etc okay whether you're going to eat it on the table you're going to go out and eat it i mean Uh, sit out on the garden and eat it, etc. What if you have? If you want to decide all of this, then that kind of a cloud is called as on-premise or your pri private cloud. Okay, but let's say I provide you a kit 
nowadays we have that concept of do it yourself kits we get it and inside that kit i provide you the dough of the pizza i provide you the sauce of the pizza okay that you can put on the sauce along with that i give you the toppings and then i leave it i give it to you and then you decide how big you want to roll the pizza where you want to bake the pizza what beverages you want to have with it okay whether you want to have it on the dining table host it outside in the garden and eat you decide but i have given you a kit and using that kit if you develop a pizza then that kind of a service is called as infrastructure as a service but let's say you are ordering the pizza from let's say domino's pizza hut wherever you want to order okay you're just placing an order and then what is happening the the uh, uh the pizza is getting delivered to your house so if you are getting your pizza delivered to your house okay you don't worry about where you are cooking it what kind of a base it is you just decide how big you want the pizza right what toppings you want on top of it and what beverages you you are going to have with it and then you decide where you want to eat and how you want where you want to sit and eat okay so that kind of a uh, service or where you get your pizza delivered is called as platform as a service okay but let's say you just go out to the restaurant and you eat pizza you don't have to do anything you just go have to and avail the services of the restaurant then that kind of a service where you get things ready already there you don't have to purchase the beverages you don't have to decide where you have to eat etc etc all that thing where you get very little flexibility all you have to go is go and eat then that kind of a service is called as software as a service clear so this is how you can remember the three services that are there and azure is more a uh, platform as a service okay and when we create a virtual machine okay that service is the only service which is ias okay but when we come to virtual machine i will talk about it so we have already uh, seen this regions what they are okay then availability zone so availability zone basically is nothing but your data center okay so when we talk about so when we talk about the availability zone inside an availability zone you can have one or two data centers okay so this is what is basically availability zone so it's nothing but discreetly i would call it a data center discreetly not a data center but because in an availability zone you can have either one or two data center so this is how the availability zone looks like and like i said availability zones are connected through low latency fiber optics they have their independent cooling networking units okay all of that is already present in the availability zone so we have kind of discussed availability zone already so this is it okay so that why the low latency optic fiber because they shouldn't contribute okay when data is being transferred across availability zones uh, they shouldn't be the reason for the delay of for the delay or the latency so that is why the fiber optics do not consume much of the data okay so that is why they are made up of uh, high low latency fiber optics and then when you um okay i will draw a diagram for that as well okay so when we have so let's say we have this azure region that is there okay so at times there can be a situation okay where the entire region goes down 
the entire region is not is not available to you okay again the same reasons natural calamity or uh, flood has occurred earthquake etc etc okay let's say one entire region has gone down okay so if that is the situation okay like i said if you have a good sla okay and you have agreed to a very little downtime then it is microsoft's responsibility to make that service available to you correct it is its responsibility to, to make it highly available to you for which otherwise if it doesn't match it will have to give some money back to you okay it is a rule okay it is a part of the sla but of course you need to pay that much then only you will get the high percentage of high availability that is there okay but let's say this entire region for some for xyz reason goes down okay so now i want to make azure's responsibility is there to make it highly available so what it does is so if this is your primary region okay let's say you have deployed it to the east us region Okay, so if this is your primary region, Azure has a secondary region created. Okay, and these two regions are then connected or become like a region pair. So if this is your primary region where you have all your services website deployed, in case this goes down, so what it will do, it will have like a another region. allocated to this primary region so if your primary region is let's say east us okay in this case so it will have a backup region also called as a secondary region okay probably east us too if these are the official regions i'm not uh, giving any other re, uh, region name so it is a part of the azure regions okay because e us is such a big region so they have divided it into east west okay uh, east us to e west us is there west us to is there okay so they have divided into four regions okay so hence the naming is like that because it's a big country okay so what happens it has a secondary region and this secondary region is like a region again right so it will have its own availability zones again only three availability zones nothing more than that and they all will be linked so if you have a good sla with azure okay that data will then or that entire service will be backed up yeah there are region pairs available in india as well i will show you the list okay so together the primary and the secondary region form something called as a region pair okay so to every region there will be another region allocated by default this is not what i have decided it is something that azure takes care of and a and a distance of 300 sorry 300 miles is is there between the two regions okay so in case one region goes down you have a backup region okay and they are linked in terms of uh, region pairs okay and every region will have a region pair of its own clear so this is how it maintains high availability again okay so this is the region pair of course for india also there is a region pair you will have to just go and search for it okay you will definitely find it then coming to like i said uh, there is a benefit of governance that azure provides or any cloud provides okay but there are certain countries which have very different governance or policies that are there okay which Uh, as your fields is a little different from the other regions that it has so what it has done is that it has segregated or separated those regions from its list and allocated to a concept called as azure sovereign regions okay 
so in now for example they have kind of separated uh, or they have created another governing body called as azure government okay which looks after the governance for only us government services like the federal services fbi uh, or navy services that are there okay all of that okay is put inside an azure government and azure government is somebody who is responsible to take care of those policies or whatever compliance needs that are there if it is from a us government service point of view okay whether it's fbi or it's the us navy uh, or the army or the air force okay so for us because they feel it is a little different okay they have kind of created another body altogether okay and that is called as the azure government and it is a part of the azure sovereign region the other region that is a part of it is china okay even azure germany is there okay which um is also another sovereign region the other region is china because china is completely different from all together okay so they have been kind of put into a separate body okay uh, china has its presence in uh, the uh, sorry azure has its presence in china it's not that it's not there okay um but it is managed by uh, someone called as 21 via net okay it is the body responsible to take care of the services resources that you deploy in the china region so that you man that you uh, adhere to their compliance and rules regulations because it's a communist party okay all whatsapp facebook instagram whatever softwares you have they also don't work in china they have their own softwares so but your azure is there but it is managed by a 21 via net okay but it has been put into a sovereign region okay it will get some priority um, in terms of this region so we will see we'll take a tour of the azure platform now when we work with azure okay i have been talking about resources i've been talking about services so these are the services that you will be building creating deploying okay when you work with azure you will see how to work with virtual machines storage accounts virtual networks okay databases etc okay we will not see how to create all of them but i will just show you one or two that is i think vms and storage account is what i will show you all how to create okay so these are the resources and then now once you have created the resources okay uh, let's say for a particular application okay you require a database you require a vm you require a storage account okay so instead of putting them into three different places okay you can put them into one place and because if you can easily manage it you know uh, you can handle it if it's in one place right like how uh, if you are working on a specific project so the entire team sits together it's not that they are scattered across in the organization like they are sitting on the first floor second floor it's not like that they all sit collectively at one place so that it is easy to you know uh work on the project together so similarly if you are, want to work on an application okay in on the azure okay and you don't want it to be scattered across different places okay you can put them into one place and that one place or that one container is called as a resource group so whenever you create any resource in azure by default you need to create a resource group you can have multiple resource groups that is also available okay but you can even put it into one this thing and that is called as a resource group you can have resources that exist in different region as compared to your resource group that is also possible okay and you can even move those resources to the resource group okay let's say you have vm created in east us and you have a resource group created in east us too no worries you can move that into the east us too region as well
I'm just coming back in a minute. Yeah. Okay, so you can put them into a logical grouping you can do. Okay, and that is called as the resource group. Okay, so now we talked about most of the things on Azure. Okay, but if I have to use Azure, okay, I need to have an appropriate subscription in order to use the Azure platform. OK, so like how uh, when we have we have these OTT platforms, right? So on the OTT platforms, uh, we do get free things we need. OK, we can access things free. But if I want to, you know, uh, go ad free, access more content, etc. What do we do? We pay, right? So similarly on Azure also, you can have a free subscription, OK, but it has a limit, OK? If I want to go beyond that, I would need to pay, and that is through the Azure subscriptions, OK? There are a number of subscriptions that is given to your to a person. So you have enterprise level subscriptions, you have a B2C subscription. Like I am a Microsoft certified trainer, so I get a subscription called as MSDN. OK, that also has difference. I mean, there are different different subscriptions even in for MCTs like some of my colleagues who are not developers. OK, they get or they are into administration or etc. They get a VSDN subscription. OK, so the cost in the development and the administration is a little different. So I get 7000, they get 11000. OK, so that's the difference. So you can see. Even in subscriptions, you have a difference, OK? And based on the subscription, OK, you can use the Azure portal, OK? So you have logged in, you have created your account, OK? Using username, password, so that is kind of like a Microsoft Entra ID, OK? Which is nothing but a, a, like a tenant to the Azure cloud. OK, like you are a tenant to the Azure cloud and that information about your username password is like a Microsoft Entra ID. OK, and so if I I have created an account, OK, no problem with that. If a uh, free account, fine. OK, you have an account, but you need to upgrade and you need to take one of the subscriptions that are there. OK, so using the subscriptions, you can kind of decide you have a, you know, a billing cycle and uh, you understand well where you can use. Like I said, I have only 7000, so like I can use services that I need to constrain in the 7000 rupees that I get or 11000 rupees that I get. OK, so it kind of sets a billing boundary and of course, till where I can use what kind of limit I have. OK, on that particular thing is all determined by my subscription. Clear? So now let's say you have the Azure subscription. You have an, uh, you know, you have created a Microsoft ID. Uh, no, there are going to be no practicals in this training. Sorry, I will be demonstrating things. Sadly, there is no practical. It's just an overview that we are doing. OK, so let's say I have I am a part of an organization and my organization requires different subscriptions. OK, so I can purchase those subscriptions and if I group those multiple subscriptions, so let's say I have sales department, I have HR department, I have marketing department and all three of them, you know, requires clouds, requires to use as your cloud. OK, so instead of put allocating only one subscription across the three departments, OK, you can purchase multiple subscriptions, OK, and allocate one of those subscriptions to each department. OK, if you do that, you kind of create a group and that group is called as the management group. OK, it is like a management group and this management group. 
it has multiple subscriptions inside that subscription also this management group is attached to a single directory so what is this directory we will see tomorrow okay uh, in the in tomorrow session we will see what is this directory okay so you kind of create a management group out of that subscriptions that are there okay and you can then you know why grouping is there because let's say you want to apply any policy okay you want to apply some constraint in your azure account okay so instead of going into every subscription okay and then applying the policies regulations and etc you can put it at the ma management group level and automatically all that rules regulations policies that you have applied will be inherited by the levels below so let's say you don't want to create or deploy any service in the china region okay you don't want to do that okay so you can apply a azure policy you can apply a policy stating that please don't deploy any service in the china region so if you apply it at the ma my management group level automatically all the subscriptions okay whether it's for the sales marketing hr okay any of those subscriptions that are there will inherit that policy okay and even the resource groups that you create inside the subscription okay will automatically inherit and even the services or the resources that are there will inherit that policy that uh that you have applied at the pro management group level okay so because for that reason for that reason if you group them together then it becomes much more easy okay so this is why you can go with management groups okay in order to handle the number of subscriptions that you have which are a part of a single directory so like if you have your organization okay you have a, a tenant id which is your micro i mean which is a organization id so that kind of becomes a directory okay it is like a tenant in the microsoft entra id okay it's like an instance of that and whoever is a part of the organization will automatically get a subscription attached to it all they have to do is be a part of that organization okay and then they can start using the azure cloud okay so this is what is the management group and then we will see how to create a resource group i will show you once we start module 2 so with this we bring an end to module 1 so let's do one thing let's take a 15 minute break it is almost uh, 420 okay so we will take a break up till 6 i mean 435 and then we will start with module 2 so i'll just start my clock Okay, so let me share my screen, and I will see you all after the break. Yeah, we can meet at four forty. That is also fine. See you after the break.
Hi guys, Chaitanya this side. Uh, as we are on break, uh, I will quickly explain you all how to get your batch activated for AZ900. I have shared the batch details in the chat box for you all. You all can go follow the steps and get the batch activated. Also, you can share this batch on your LinkedIn and other profiles. I will make sure you will get the batch activated and you can share the batch on your other profiles like LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, this steps has been mentioned in the chat box with the URL. Uh, to get the batch activated, you just have to uh, you know, you just have to search Microsoft Learn. As soon as that, you will get a link with a training Microsoft Learn. You have to click on that. You have to create your profile. If you have your profile created on Microsoft Learn, no need to create another one. But if you don't have your profile created on Microsoft Learn, you have to sign in and create your profile. After that, on new tab, you have to click the URL which has been shared with the steps. The batch which has been shared with the steps, you have to click on that uh, URL. After that, you will get a redemption button. You have to click on that redeem button and get the batch activated. As soon as I click on the redeem button, uh, the pop up will come as the batch activated. You can view on your profile under the achievements. Under the achievements, you can see the module courses learning path. There you will get your batch with the completion date. Like if I have completed my batch on 17th of Jan, uh, the date will be mentioned as completed on 17th Jan 2024. Also, as I have mentioned, you can share this batch on your LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter profile. You can also print your uh, batch. Once you activate the batch, you will get the batch on your profile and you can get the print button. Beside the batch, you can go on that print button and get your batch printed. Guys, I have pasted the URL in the chat box. Guys, those who are still facing the problem, you just have to simply please uh, check my screen. You just simply have to go on Microsoft Learn as I have uh, typed 
on my screen as you can see i have typed microsoft learn i will go on microsoft learn here i will see the uh, link i have to i will click on this link those who have not uh, yet activated the batch please note you have to follow certain steps as uh, here you can see as i have my profile already created i will go on my profile if you have not created the profile you will get a button uh, to sign in you just have to go on the sign in button you have to click on that sign in button and create your account once you create the account you will get your profile activated after that what you have to do you you just simply have to go on new you uh, tab and the, you just have to click on the url which has been mentioned uh, in the chat box let me copy the url first I will copy the URL here and I will enter. You can see I will get the redeem button. As my profile has been created, I will automatically get the redeem button to activate the batch. You just simply have to click on that redeem button to get the batch activated. Here you can see that batch has been activated on my profile. I can see it on my profile. I will go on view profile to check whether my batch has been activated. Under the achievement, I can see there is the course uh, mentioned course module and learning path. The batch has been activated over here. You can see completed on uh, Jan 17, 2024. Before. The batch title will reflect with Microsoft Azure AI fundamental. And if you have to share this batch, you just go on this share icon, click on the share icon, and you can share it on the profile like LinkedIn, Twitter. Also, if you want to print the batch, you just have to click on this print icon and get your batch printed. If I want to go to the modules related to this batch, I will click on the modules. So I, the modules will reflect over here. And if I want to go through the learning path, I will click on the learning path. So the learning path for the AZ900 will mention here. As soon as you will, uh, you know, uh, get the batch activated. Yes, please make sure you get the batch activated and if you are facing the problem related to the batch redemption do let me know in the chat box
uh guys there might be some problem while the redemption i guess or with the code i don't know but i have shared the other code again in the chat box for you all you all can go and check this link uh once you click on this you will get the az 900 batch please try with this uh, url i will request all to try the new url which has been shared in the chat box to get the az 900 batch Uh, yes, guys, those who have by mistakely added AI batch, uh, there is no harm in that. You all can go and get the AZ900 batch, which has been shared in the chat box just now. Ten steps you have to follow and get the batch activated. If the batch is reflecting as AI, please make sure you uh, go on the second URL, which has been shared in the chat box and get the AZ900 batch activated. Guys, please go ahead and redeem the new badge badges that Chaitali has shared. I'm giving you all five minutes for it. And then after that, we will start the session. Guys, please put done in the chat box so you can go ahead and resume the session. We are waiting for you all to get the batch activated. Yes, guys, please mention done in the chat box if you have activated the batch so we can move ahead.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead. We are now going to start with module two. So module two basically talks about the different services that are there available in Azure. Okay, so we are now going to focus on the Azure platform itself. So today I will do half module two. And tomorrow, uh, or let's see if time permits, I'll complete module two. Depends. I can't guarantee, but half we will do today, and whatever remains, we will do tomorrow in tomorrow's uh, session. Okay. So let's get started. So these are the services that we are going to see in Azure that is the compute, networking, storage, identity, and access and security. So I plan to complete till the storage service that is there. And then after that, identity and access and security we will cover tomorrow. So coming to the compute and the networking services. So as the name says compute, okay, it's going to be something that is related to the compute of the resources like memory, uh, operating systems, uh, networking, etc. Where, like I said, you want the full flexibility to manage a computing aspect, what kind of memory you want, whether it should be a HDD, SSD, okay, uh, what kind of um, uh, operating system you want, whether you want Linux, you want uh, Windows, okay, all that configuration, if you want the flexibility of that, then you would go with the computing services, okay. So the classic example of a computing service in Azure is your Azure virtual machine. So what is a virtual machine? We all know it's nothing but the software emulation of your physical computer, exact replica of your physical computer. So it includes processors, it includes memory, it includes storage, that is nothing but memory again. And of course, networking, okay, what kind of protocols is allowed, not allowed, okay, all that things that you want to configure, okay, you can do that in a virtual machine. And a virtual machine is the only IS offering in the Azure cloud platform that is there, okay, it is a infrastructure as a service, okay, which uh, where you get the entire flexibility that I just talked about. So earlier, if you recall, uh, uh, we would be using the virtual machines. Normally, what we would do, we would create the virtual machine on a local system. So what was the disadvantage? Like whatever memory I have of my local system, correct, I would only utilize that inside that. First of all, we would need to install something called as virtual box Oracle virtual box, right? And then once we have that Oracle virtual box installed then on top of that we would install the operating system image that we want configure the memory the ram how much ram should be allocated to the virtual machine okay how many uh, computing or cpu units we would need to allocate to that particular machine all that configuration what we would do normally on the local system think about it just put it to the internet Okay, the exact same thing we will, if we put it to the internet, that is nothing but the virtual machine. But here, the difference is I don't need to manage my own. Uh, I don't have, no, Bastion is not being covered, uh, sadly, in AZ-900. Bastion service we are not going to do. We are going to just look at the RDP that is there. Okay, so, um, yeah. So, in terms of virtual machine, so normally here, we, we are just going to put everything online instead of our local system. Okay, so this is how a virtual machine is there. We are going to see how to create a virtual machine in Azure. Okay. Now I talked about scalability. I talked about elasticity. Okay, so like I said, scalability is something in your hand. Okay, so you can scale your VMs. Okay, uh, using the scale out or scale in. That's the scalability that is offered when you are talking about VMs, scalability of VMs, okay? If you don't want to configure the scaling, you can auto-scale your things, and auto-scaling is nothing but elasticity, okay? That, like I said, it is dynamic. This is not dynamic. This you configure, 
So you can do that using the VM scale sets. So if you configure VM scale sets, that means you are talking about scalability. Then coming to availability. So like I said, we talked about the availability zones. OK, there is another concept and that is called as availability sets. So like I said, in an availability zone, you have data centers. OK, and inside the data center, it is divided into racks. OK, so imagine your VM is stored or created or deployed. OK, on to rack one of your data center. So normally what happens is that that one rack can also undergo something called as a fault domain or an update domain. Now, what do I mean by a fault domain? So like, for example, for that rack, the power can go. OK, there can be a failure at the power level. OK, when there is no electricity only for that rack. OK. So that is called as the fault domain that comes under the fault domain. But let's say that entire rack, the servers that are there on that rack are undergoing an update, are undergoing a firmware update. OK, so that kind of a domain is called as the update domain. So when such thing is happening, OK, you can put your you can configure your or you can uh, make your VMs highly available onto another rack within the same data center and that is called as the availability set. So you can make your VMs highly available in the region, OK, in the availability zones or through the availability sets. This is up to you. You decide. OK, so if you have your VM in availability zone one and in case availability zone one goes down. OK, you have the other two options and you can then make your VM available over there. OK, so uh, in VM, I don't think there is horizontal scaling, but only I think only vertical scaling is there in terms of VM and that is through the VM scale sets. OK. So let's go ahead and create a simple VM on the Azure cloud. OK, uh, we are going to use the portal Azure portal, which is nothing but the UI tool that I was talking about. So let's go ahead and create. A Azure uh, virtual machine, so I'm going to go and navigate. So I'm in my Azure portal right now. So this is how your portal looks like. OK, you have different services listed down. This is where you can search for a particular resource or service that you want to create. OK, then you can. Uh, this is the marketplace. So if I just click on this, so this is the marketplace where you can come and search for a specific resource according to the category. OK, whether you want to deploy. Uh, OK, whether you want to deploy uh, whether you want to create any service in AI, in IoT, in DevOps, in uh, containers, okay, which we will see in some time, okay, you can come and do that over here. So this is like the marketplace where you can go and search for any service or resource that you want on Azure. So let's go ahead and create a simple virtual machine. So you can come here and you can search for it as well, or you can go to create a resource and do that. OK, but like I said, before we create any. Resource, we need a resource group for uh, logical container, like a logical container we can build in order to put all the things in one group. OK, so I'm going to go and create a resource group first. You can search for it. You can get it. If you have recently searched for it, you will get that icon over here. So I'm going to go ahead and create a resource group. So I'm going to give it a name, uh, training. OK, and create it in the East US region and just click on review plus create. So this is one way of creating a resource group. There is another way also which I will show you all.
Okay, so this resource group has been created. Let's go ahead and create a virtual machine. And I'm going to, so here also you have an option to create new. So you can click on it and you can create a new resource group directly over here or the other way is the way I showed you just now. Okay, so I'm from the drop down list. I'm going to select this particular, this thing and give it a name. So I'm going to go with VM01 and I'm going to select this region because I get uh, the cost is relatively low. Okay, so here now you have availability options. Like I said, you can select out of it. You have the availability set. You have availability zone. You can decide what um, what kind of availability you want. Okay, so by default it is going at zone one in East US region that I have. Okay, you can decide to configure it. Okay. Now I'm going to create a Windows operating system. So I'm going to go with the latest one. Uh, let's go with this edition that is there. I don't know why. I'll look for an. Okay. We'll go with this. It's fine. And in I'll go with the basic one. Give a username. So I'm going to say Azure user. Give it a password. Give a password that you can remember. Okay. And I'll go with HDD. HDD is a cheaper option. So that is why I'm going with that. And uh, in basic, um, I think this is fine. Yeah, we can select the ports that we want to allow. Okay, you can go with RDP, HTTP, HTTPS. Okay, uh, all of this we can do. But as of now, we are just going to go with RDP. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and say review plus create. So here you can see it is giving me a cost of our on hourly basis. Okay, so it's going to charge me this much. So I'm going to go ahead and create the VM. Yes, you are going to get the recordings for that. My team will update about it.
Okay. Okay, till the time the service is being deployed. We can, I'll just quickly go through the other services. Okay, so coming to the next service that is Azure Virtual Desktop. So what it is, it is like, let's say you can't afford to, you know, in your organization, you can't afford to buy a laptop for every employee that is there. Okay, so what you can do is you can create a virtual desktop and you can give people the access to that desktop, which is like a virtualized environment. Okay, without giving any more, without giving laptops. So they all have to come into that particular session. Okay, join in, give their credentials, and from anywhere they can access this particular desktop that has been created. So it uses the RDP protocol. Okay, so instead of creating, uh, so in the same environment, multiple sessions or multiple people can log in and use that particular environment. Like for example, if it's a team that is working on a specific uh, project which requires certain environment and you know, creating on different laptops, instead of doing that, you can put it into one this thing and you can use it. So you can just give access to them and create sessions, okay, out of that. And then you can work on the same desktop. So this is what is called as Azure Virtual Desktop. Then coming to container, okay, we know that when we are talking about deploying an application, etc., okay, we have a concept of containers. Now, this comes into picture when you are talking about microservices, okay. So, imagine the Amazon e commerce website, okay, in that we have so many services on one service itself, like we can go shop, okay, search, we can do billing. Okay, once we have got what we want, we put it into the cart, we go for billing, right? We can do, we can watch, uh, they have that mini TV option also nowadays. We can go watch uh, series for free, okay? So those are what, those are different small, small services on the same as your website. Now, if I want all these services to come onto one, entire big service so these small services form a part of micro service so those are smaller services within a smaller service okay so when i want something that provides isolation now i don't want these different services for example my billing service i can write in a uh, java language or python language my search uh, service that is there, it is written in probably Java language. So let's say I don't want any interference between these services to occur. No problem being caused when I am, you know, I have these services on one platform being deployed. They shouldn't interfere with each other. Okay. Then you can go with the container. So what is, so instead of creating, so when we are deploying an application and application itself requires its own os its own other uh, hypervisor etc so on top of one operating system you would need to install another guest os let's say i don't want that so normally what will happen when i have an operating system and on top of that i am installing another guest operating system so let's say my uh, search and search I'm using, or let's say I'm doing the billing and Python works better if we have a Linux operating system. And let's say my base operating system is a Windows operating system. So in order to run the billing service, I would need a Linux operating system. So generally, if I have an operating system, which is Windows and top of that i am installing another operating system okay it tends to become heavy okay it becomes slow it becomes heavy and for me to access the billing service will become very difficult okay so in that situation 
you use something called as the container. So container is lightweight. Okay, it is something that comes packaged with that operating system. Yeah, otherwise you would need to, but here if you are using container, you would not need to create another guest OS. Okay, or for just the billing service, which is written in Python language. Okay, if you have a container, you can just create a container which comes packaged with whatever you need the operating system. Okay, and it once you deploy the container on the operating system, it will start, it will run its own service. Okay, and not interfere with your current operating system that is there. So if I want a isolation and I want something that is lightweight, okay, that is that that's when you go and use a container service. Okay, so a container service, if I want to create a, a very uh, a famous container service is there, that is the Docker. Okay, that is there and you can use it even over here. So when you're working on Azure, there are two types of container services. That is Azure Container Instance, ACI. Okay, and the other is the Kubernetes service. So both are container services. But now what is the difference between the two? Uh, Kubernetes is something that offers orchestration. Now what do I mean by orchestration? Orchestration is something like, let's say, uh, we talked about scalability. Okay, so if I want my service, particular service to scale, okay, in order to manage the load, okay, like multiple people are doing billing at the same time, okay, if I want to manage that load, then I will go with the Kubernetes service for which orchestration is provided. So that's the difference between the two that is there. So when you have large volumes of data to manage, then you would go with the Kubernetes service. OK, then moving ahead. Then Azure functions. So at times there are situations or scenarios where I don't want to manage the virtual machines or create servers, manage the servers in order to, you know, uh, create websites or applications. OK, I just want to focus on the coding. OK, I just want to write a code and see whether it's working or not. Or, or another scenario is, let's say you want something that is triggered based on an event like you have IOT. OK, let's say the temperature has reached 30 degrees centigrade okay, or has gone beyond 30 degrees centigrade and you want your AC or your fan to switch on. So it's what it's like a trigger. So you want to focus or you want something that is trigger based and you don't want to waste time on configuring the servers, then you can go with something called as Azure Functions. So Azure Functions is like a serverless computing that is offered, which helps developers to focus entirely on the code rather than worrying about the infrastructure that is required for that particular service. OK, and it is used normally when there is an event based situation. OK, so you put that in your code and the moment that event comes occurs, it is kind of triggered. So if I want to work in that particular scenario, then you would go with Azure functions, which is like a serverless computing. So serverless does not mean that there are no servers. Definitely there are servers, but it's not your job to manage it. Azure will take care of that and you just focus on the code that you want to write on. So it can be an HTTP trigger. It can be uh, some uh, IoT based trigger, anything you need to configure that. OK, the trigger you will write and you can then write the code for it. Then you can even deploy applications. OK, uh, where you are, uh, where you don't want to uh, again, um, you know, uh, create a VM and then uh, install containers, etc. If you don't want to do that, you can create an app service where you can create websites, applications in the language that you want. OK, whether you are good at .NET, you're good at 
uh, Python, any language, just you can deploy your service, you can manage your service from here. So let's say you've created a website in your Visual Studio code or something, okay, and you want to make it available to the production level, test it, okay? You can do that using the app service. So automatically on the cloud, a framework will be created for you and you can test your API, scale out your APIs, okay? Similar to the VMs that are there, but this is like a pass offering. It is a platform as a service, okay? Again, you don't know what is going at the background, what kind of operating system will be used, though you get the flexibility of the, of the language that you want it, okay? So like if you have a Python, a Flask application that you have written, you can certainly put it to production over here using the app services. All you need to do is configure to which language do you want it to do and APIs will be then created quickly. Like it will deploy quickly at the production level. Okay, instead of doing it at the development level, normally we would test it at the development level, right? And then put it to production. So again, different testing is there different testing you need to do at the production level. Okay, so you can do that in the app service. So now uh, the VM has been created. Let's go and see how to access the VM. So I'm gonna share my portal. So here you can see the VM has been created. So I'm gonna go to the resource. <clears throat> Yes, it will provide the environment for the application. When you're using the app service, okay, it will provide the environment. Just what language have you written it in? You need to put that, okay? Like if you have written it in Python, you need to put Python and take the latest uh, Python version, but I think it is 3.11. Uh, currently, I'm not, uh, yeah, it is 3.11. So you just need to select that. Okay, whether it's .NET, you have written it in .NET, so you need to select .NET and LTS or long-term service or whatever is there, and you can use that. So now this is my VM. Let's connect to the VM. Okay, so I'm going to go with connect. So Bastion is not a part of this, sadly. And I'm going to use RDP. So download the RDP file. I'm just going to say keep. And once this is downloaded, Click on open, say connect. So a session will be created. Now you can see my user name has come in. So I'm going to give it the password that I had given while I created the VM. Say okay. Just click on yes. Okay, so this is how your virtual machine will look like. So since we have taken a Windows VM, so you can see this is the image that it has, okay? And now we can log out of this, we don't need it. So I'll just disconnect from the session, just say okay. And now I will, stop the VM. So if you don't want to, you know, uh, keep your VM up and running, you can stop it. But keep in mind, you will be still charged for it. Why? Because you have a VM created at the East US location, in my case over here. Okay. So where the VM is created on the rack and the server, that storage cost will, you will be uh, incurring that cost. That cost will be applied to you. So in case you don't want the VM, okay, you can go and completely delete it. Otherwise you can just stop it. But remember that you will be incurred with the loss. Okay, you, I mean, with the cost, you will be charged for it. So if you want to delete, just click on delete. Okay, because I'm not going to require the VM. Just click on it and just say delete. It will automatically 
delete the VN for you. Okay. So this was about the compute services in Azure. Let's see some of the networking services in Azure. So let's say I want to, you know, communicate between two services like two VMs, two databases, OK, whether it's on cloud or it's on uh, on premise or private cloud. OK, if I want to communicate, we can do that through the virtual network. OK, that is the Azure virtual network. So when we create an Azure virtual network, the endpoints can be public. OK, that is that means it is available to the public. OK, those IP addresses are available. Otherwise, we can go with a private endpoint where you want to keep it accessible within the network itself. OK, the network that you have created. OK, and then of course you can divide the network into smaller networks. That is the subnets. Of course, you need to know how to uh, divide the IP addresses into different classes. OK, using the sorry, using the CIDR notation that is there. You would need to do that and within that then you can do network peering and etc. So we know what is network peering. It's like sharing information or talk communicating between two uh, private networks. OK, so you have created VMs, I mean virtual networks, and you want to, you know, uh, have a communication between the two networks, then you can certainly do that using the network pe network peering that is there. Now, if you want to keep it private between the on premise and the cloud, OK, you can go with uh, NSGs more in terms of security, which we will see tomorrow. OK, it's about security. It's not about the network that is there. If you want to put services within the same network, OK, then you would go with the networking services. But if you want to make your services secure, then you would go with the security network security groups that are there. So it's about security and this is about networking. OK, about configuring IP addresses, OK, creating subnets, dividing that entire IP range into subnets, OK, uh, whether to create a public endpoint, private endpoint, all of that is a part of the networking services. OK, so if you want to keep a private encrypted channel, OK, between your Azure virtual network that you have created and a network that is available on the on premise, then you can go with the VPN, which is nothing but the private network that is their virtual private network, and you can establish like a gateway between the two. OK, so this is one service that is there. Then you have something called as Express Route. OK, let's say some service requires a high bandwidth and along with that you want to keep it private. OK, you want to keep the connectivity a uh, private connection. OK, then. That kind of a service. Where you need best of the I mean you need these two requirements. It is called as the Azure Express route. OK, so it's just more of high bandwidth and faster connectivity if you require and keep the connection uh, private. OK, between let's say on I mean on premise and your Azure, you can do that through the Azure Express route. The other service now that you have is called as the Azure DNS. OK, so what is the DNS? It's not like a domain registry service. Uh, it's not similar to your GoDaddy that you have where you can go and register the websites that you have created. It's not that. OK, so it's the next step after the registration of your websites. So let's say you have registered your website on the GoDaddy Go or uh, this thing. OK, so once you have registered and let's say I want to find out uh, or I want to go to that website. OK, so let's say I want to go to www.example.com. OK, so normally your uh, server OK, will have something called as a name server. So when we put a request, it goes to a web server, right? And when I say www.example.com, it goes to a web server and that web server will not understand 
the www.example.com what will it understand it will understand the ip address behind that web address okay so when i say www.example.com it will go to the name server of your web web server that is there so web name server is what is like a directory which has all the ip addresses attached to the web addresses that you have registered so it's like a phone directory that is there okay so that phone directory or that name server will have your uh, domain name okay like www.example.com and it will take that domain name see the ip address search in its name server okay and then forward that give you a response okay the web server will then give you a response okay so if i want this process instead of being done on go daddy instead of or doing on the google you can also use an alternative that is the azure dns so the dns service job is just to give you the website okay give you the response to the request that you have given okay it, through its name server and if it has to search for the ip addresses in its name server it uses something called as any cast okay it's the method that is that it uses okay and you can use that so this is what the azure dns service does okay so this is the use of it so this is the last service that is there in the networking there is not much to this actually so that is why i just you know i went very fast in it but uh, you just need to know about the virtual network and the vpn i think that's it otherwise uh, it, it is not required now coming to the next services that we have is the storage services let's see how you can store your data okay in the azure platform so there are ways in which you can store your data either you can do it through the database or you can do it through the storage accounts or the file system that we have and the classic example of the storage account is your blob storage that is there okay so we are going to see about the blob storage so storage as the name says it will store data okay um and we can store so can you quickly tell me how many types of data what are the three different types of data that we have can you all list down the three types of data that is there yes guys can you all list down So when we talk about data and its types, okay, it is generally of three types. That is structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. So structured data is something that resembles a fixed schema. Okay, it is something that has a structure to it. Okay, uh, like a table, which is like a column, which has a column and a row. Okay, and you have you know the data type of every column. Okay, you know the data type of uh, like if it's string value, it is numeric value, etc. Okay, and you can access this information that is stored stored in the structured format using the structured query language that is the sql okay so it's like a query language you query the database okay so generally this kind of data is stored in a database okay database is again like a uh, like a yeah a, something that captures data in table format okay so you don't need to know about it much 
So now semi-structured, it is something that has a flexible schema. Okay, it is something that is not stored in the form of table. It can have a flexible schema to it, like your key value pair that you have. Okay, for example, we all know uh, JSON, that is JavaScript object notation. So a file, if you save it, which has something like a key value pair, Okay, you would normally go with the dot JSON extension. So that kind of data, if you have, okay, you are basically having a semi-structured data. Now, unstructured meaning having no schema at all. Okay, and you can, it's like raw data, okay, completely raw that is there. And you would normally, um, uh, yeah, you can store this in something or as, a uh, data lake. So if you you can store it in a data lake. So it's something like a dump yard where you just go and dump things. Okay. So you can store it not actually not just in a data lake, but you can even uh, put it into a database like a NoSQL database. Okay, and there are types to it that is graph, columnar, and document. Okay, you can even store it, but those databases are a little different. Okay, like you can have graph, and thing for graph, it is Gremlin. For columnar, you have Cassandra. So uh, we all know Netflix, right? Netflix uses, has an unstructured data. And it uses Cassandra to store its uh, movies, series, or document documentaries that it has. Okay, and I think for document, you can go with uh, MongoDB that is there. Okay, uh, you can use MongoDB in order to uh, store the unstructured format of data. So now this data. Now, the, here we can have it in CSV format also, which is comma separated. Okay, we can have um, we can have some other files or or we can store it or we can store data in file format also. Okay, and we have different types of files like JSON. You have CSV. You have text files. You have image files. Right. Uh, J JPEG, you have audio video files. So generally, these files are, you know, have a, are generally large in size. Okay. In terms of storage, they are generally large in size. So when I have to store this kind of data, we normally use the binary large object. OK, that is also short form is the blob. OK, and if I have to store this data, we would normally use the Azure blob storage. OK, and Azure blob storage has something called as containers. OK, this is or let's say storage account. Azure storage is basically divided into four. That is your container or the blob where you can store these formats, then you have is the file file system. So let's say you want to do a, you want to share data over your VMs in the virtual network. You have VMs and you want to share data. OK, share files across the VMs so you can use the file system. So it uses two protocols that is SMB, that is server message block. SMB, okay, and network file system, that is the NFS, okay, it uses these two protocols, these are the protocols, so similar to your FTP protocols that we have, it uses that, then you can even store data in the form of a queue, okay, how we queue our messages, so similarly you can queue your data and you can store it, Okay, that kind of a storage is called as queue storage. 
And then finally, the fourth type is the table. Table storage. So we are just going to see the block storage, which will help you store these formats of data that is there. OK, whether it's a JSON file, it's a text file, it's an audio file, video file. OK, you can store data over there. But if you want to share files across VMs, across virtual networks, you will go with the file system. OK, and you can then if you want to queue your data similar to your mails, you can go with the queue storage and table storage is like your classic key value pair. OK, you have a key and then you have a value. Like if you go to any library, OK, you have the author name. And against that author name, you have multiple books. OK, so it's the same thing. You can do that if you want to create a storage similar to that. You can go with the storage table storage. OK. So now coming to the Azure blob storage. So this is what we are going to see. Now, in terms of the recovery or redundancy, okay. See, like I can jump directly to the practical, but you will not understand a single thing. So let me just cover the theoretical part. Okay, once that is done, then we will definitely see, and that is going to be the last part of the. Uh, of this training for today. OK, now coming to the blob storage or coming to any storage that is there. OK, we need like like we saw that we can make our data highly available for VMs. OK, uh, we can similarly make our data highly redundant. OK, let's say. Um, we want to back up our data. We want to store our data at different or, uh, you know, we want a copy of our data also. OK, that is stored in a storage account. OK, that process is called as redundancy in storage. Re redundancy is nothing but replication. Or yeah, basically replication or copying copy of your data, which is stored across the regions. So earlier we saw OK, earlier we saw something like this, that there is an Azure region. And to that Azure region, we have another region pair, correct? And within the Azure region, we have three availability zones, correct? OK, and inside the availability zones, like I said, there is a data center that can be one, two, three, whatever. OK, now let's say I want to make my data. I want to make my data highly redundant. That means I want to replicate my data so that in case I have any failure. OK, I my data is protected. And Microsoft provides four ways of making your data highly redundant. The first is called as the. Locally. Redundant, sorry, locally LRS, locally redundant. Storage, the short form is LRS. So this is nothing but uh, three copies. Three synchronous, I'll put synchronous. Copies of data. Within the same within the same availability. Zone. OK, now what do I mean by this? So we know at a data center, so let's say this is AZ1. 
in a region we have three availability zones and inside the availability zones we have data centers so i'm going to call this as dc1 okay so inside the inside the data center i told you there is racks right we have racks so if you go with the nrs okay sorry guys this is a theoretical subject if you're looking for practicality it is very little okay since this is a webinar okay i uh, normally you know webinar we would not even teach this okay uh, but if you have to understand the practicality you need to understand this otherwise you will not understand what is what i mean by what okay then you will again come back to me and say you didn't explain this because i directly jump to the practical concepts okay so please have some patience i know it is nearing to the time you are exhausted even i am exhausted okay so please bear with me for a few minutes okay let me explain and then i'm definitely going to go to the practical this thing okay so now coming to the data center level we know there are racks in that data center level okay and okay so we know there are data there are racks okay inside the data center level so let's say i have gone for the lrs system okay and i have my data stored at rack 1 within the data center okay so i have stored data over here now what does lrs say that it makes or it will copy your data okay three times within the same availability zone or within the same data center so what will happen you have stored data at rack 1 okay you will have copies of that data okay you will have few cop you will have copy of that data within the so the same copy of the data will be created okay inside the same data center so you will have kind of three copies okay across the same i mean in the same data center okay so what will happen now is that in case this particular rack goes down okay in case this particular rack goes down for some reason for fault domain or update domain okay you can what will happen is that your data is still backed up by right? because there are copies of that data within the same data center and now what do i mean by synchronous so synchronous means that when you are creating the data you're storing the data in the data uh, in the storage account okay uh, at the same time the copy will be created within the same data center okay at the same time the copies of your data will be created within the same data center okay so that is what is called as synchronous copies of data this is what synchronicity means over here so in case your data at rack level 1 goes down you have the data backed up in the other racks of the same data center but now what if the entire availability zone goes down what happens then so in order to save yourself or in order to save your data make your data redundant from data center level failure okay you can go with another redundancy and that is called as the zone redundant storage or short form zrs okay now what does this do so this will again make three synchronous copies of your data but it will be across the other availability zone of your region so what will happen you will definitely store your data 
okay it's let's say it is at uh, i'll take the other availability zone you have your data center here okay you have data you have your data over here okay so probably you are in availability zone you have your data okay this is your availability zone too you have your data over here so when you go for zrs okay within the same region we know there are availability zones so instead of storing at availability zone 2 it will make three different copies across the other two availability zones within the same region okay so in case availability zone 2 goes down okay the entire availability zone goes down okay you can kind of get your data back okay you can get your data back why because it will be backed up in the other two availability zone okay and again synchronous the same concept comes into picture okay so what will happen so here you have your data so in case now at the data center level okay your data has which is in availability zone 1 okay it has gone down since you have your data backed up using the zrs you will still find it available either at availability zone 2 or at availability zone 3 within the same region okay so this is what zrs does but now for some xyz reason this entire region goes down then what do you do okay then what do you do for that you have another available you have another uh, redundancy and that is called as the geo redundant storage which is nothing but the grs so grs is nothing but your lrs plus three asynchronous now i asynchronous i will tell you copies of data okay so this is what is grs so it is nothing but lrs it is picking up the concept of lrs okay but it will be done where it will be done at the secondary region so we know there is a region pair okay so what will it do it will go to the second region and follow the same thing again here we are going to have three availability zones correct within that we have the data centers okay so what it will do it will take your data and in so here you will have a data copy at one availability zone it will take that data and in the first availability zone it will make copies of it okay as of now i'm just showing these many copies but these copies that are there will be asynchronous meaning the moment you create a or store your data in the region primary region at the same time data will not be replicated in the secondary region after a few hours or you know some time it will take but the action will not be synchronous which is the same in lrs and zrs it is going to be synchronous but here it will not be synchronous after some delay your data will be replicated in the secondary region clear so this is how the grs works now let's say at the secondary region also this particular data center only this i mean where your data is goes down okay then you have another redundant storage for that and that is called as the geo zone redundant storage which is nothing but the gzrs which is nothing but zrs plus 3 asynchronous copies of data okay okay so it will restore from the second region secondary region in grs not the primary if the primary is gone down it will 
search in this is in terms of failure. Okay, when your data is not available at the primary location, then it will go to the secondary region. So this is how it will do. It will create copies like this. So it will do LRS, put it in availability zone one of your primary region, as well as in uh, another availability zone of your secondary region. Okay, so then it will have a backup. So in case your availability zone one goes down, okay, you have a backup in the secondary region. Okay. So this is what GZRS will do. Again, the same concept of ZRS, just asynchronous. Okay, but of course, GRS, GZRS will have maximum durability. We call it as durability when we are talking in terms of uh, redundancy. Okay, it will be highly durable. No, no uh, problem of that. It is done in terms of uh, depends on the number of nines, similar to your SLA, but uh, it will cost more. Of course, you can make it out. Okay, it is going to be very expensive uh, when you are working or you're using GRS or GZRS. Okay. Now coming to the next concept, that is the accessibility. How you can access your files or your data? Okay, in a blob storage, there are four ways. In which you can access. The first is the hot tier. We call it as access tiers. Okay, I'm going to say access tiers. So the first is the hot tier. So this kind of accessibility that is there, it is used when you are accessing data on a frequent basis or something that is very critical. Okay, like your healthcare. Uh, services where you need to access data frequently or for example banking solutions okay where uh, data is going to be accessed on a daily basis okay where you go every day and you need to access data that kind of a tier okay is called as the hot access tier okay then you have is the cold tier now cold meaning you are accessing data probably after a month, okay? Like your sales data, okay? You will not access it on a frequent basis, right? It's not something that you require daily. It is something that you can access after a month. Like when you want to do a comparison between two, um, so between the sales done in month of January and December, then you can go for this particular access here. So you can store data in this particular access tier, okay, uh, where you access data uh, within 30 days, that is a month, okay? So it's not something that you access on a frequent basis. You access it, let's say, in 30 days once, okay? That kind of a data is called as the cold access tier. Currently, Microsoft has also launched another, uh, sorry, sorry, this is called as cool access tier. Yes, costing depends on that. I will tell you all about that. The fourth, this is the one they have recently launched, which is access data within 90 days. Okay, you can access data if you have data which you don't access on a frequent basis, but after three months you access that particular data, then you can store the particular uh, data uh, or access that data using the cold access here. Okay. Finally, you have something called as the archive here. So this is something that you don't access on a daily basis. You access data, let's say within 180 days, that is six months. Okay. So if you think that some data is not very critical, does not require to be accessed on a frequent basis, you can archive and you can keep it how how the name archive means. OK, you can kind of store it and access it like after six months. That is also fine. OK, so the cheapest out of all is the archive tier because you're not going to access it frequently. And since hot tier is something that you would require to access on a daily basis, OK, that is going to be the costliest of all. OK, 
clear? So these are the ways in which you can access the data in your storage account. So now let's go and create a simple storage account. OK, I'm going to show you how to create a block storage. So you can go to the storage account. Say create. And I'm going to use the same resource group that is there. Say store training storage account and put it as this. So your name has to be unique. OK. So it doesn't shouldn't have a conflict. And here you can see you can select the redundancy. So I'm going to go with locally redundant. My data is not that critical. I mean, it's not something that I need to back up. OK, so you can back it up. And your GRS, your GZRS depends on the region that you select here. OK, what kind of a region there is down. OK, that will determine the GRS, GZRS that is there. So let's go ahead and click on review. And click on create. So it will create a storage account. So the resource has been created. So let me go to the resource and create a blob container. So like I said, blob is nothing but the container service that is there in the storage account. So here if you see, you have the four types, file share or queues and tables. So you can come here and create any of the four that you need. So here we are going to go with a blob container. So click on this container, give it a name. I'm going with a simple name called as data. OK, and going ahead and saying create. So it has been created. Let's go and upload a simple file. OK, so I'm going to go click on upload. Browse from for the files from my system. And I'm going to upload a image file. OK, you can upload CSV, text, or any file, Excel file, whatever you want. You can upload here and I'm just going to go and say upload. Now you can go and see this file. Just click on it. OK, you can come here, edit it so you can see the file that is there. So this is an image file. OK, if you go to the overview, you can see by default it will have a hot access tier here if you see it has an hot access tier you can definitely change the tier so here if you click on change tier you can go with any of the other three types that are there pool cold archive and you can change the tier okay so this is how you can create a simple storage account that is there in azure Coming to the presentation. I think we have covered the storage. OK, some more services, just two more, and I think we'll be done. OK, I just uh, inform you about it. So we saw all of this. Now let's say you want to perform migrations. OK, you want to migrate any service in Azure, whether it's uh, from on premise to uh, cloud. OK, Azure has a dedicated service for that, and that is called as the Azure migrate. OK, so you can migrate any 
uh, service that you want, whether it's a SQL server, you can uh, even migrate your data. OK, uh, you can do any migration services that you want using this particular service. Its job is just to do migration, so you can go to it. It has a separate portal altogether. OK, a separate platform in order to do that. You can just go ahead and use that service in case you want to migrate to a lift and shift operation. OK, you can go and do that. Then let's say you want to. You know, move your data. OK, uh, and that data ranges in the size of PBs. PBs, OK, terabytes, petabytes. OK, that is the size of your data. OK, then instead of using the storage account, you can use something called as the Azure data box. So a data box is like an actual physical box. OK, it's like a box that will be delivered to you by Microsoft. OK, it will be sent to you and you can put your data inside it. OK, and you can then send that box to a, to anyone whom you want and you can recover your data in that way. OK, you can store or migrate your data as well in that way. In case you know there is no uh, it's a, it has a it is in a remote location. There is not much Internet connectivity. OK, or not uh, or zero connectivity. So you can use this data box. It stores up to 80 terabytes of data. OK, and you can migrate your data, move your data to any other region. OK, so this is how you can do or you can use the Azure data box and it's like an actual physical box. OK, it will be delivered to your house. OK, and you can put in like how you have a hard disk kind of a thing. OK, similar to that, but of course the size is going to be large. OK, so with this we bring an end to the storage services and like I said, we will continue module two tomorrow. OK, we have the identity and the security services that are there and look at some of the services in that and then finally move to module three, which will talk about monitoring and managing tools in Azure. So tomorrow's session will be a little cut short. It will not be more of practical. It will be uh, more of, no, you know, making you aware. OK, uh, we, I will not be doing things practically, definitely, but I will be telling you this is the service. This is the service because AZ-900 does not have much practical. Sorry for that. Um, if you want to do practical, OK, go for one of the advanced certifications. OK, they have full, they're full of practicals. OK, and you can do that over there. Uh, but in terms of AZ-900, we will tomorrow see the identity and access and security services and of course see module three. So thank you so much everyone for attending today's session. See you all tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Mansi, for this wonderful webinar. Uh, I hope all the participants found today's AZ900 uh, webinar, which was hosted by Mansi, ma'am. If you have any question and queries, please put on question on chat box. Uh, our speaker will be there to help you out. So Guys, also I shared the feedback the... form. Yeah, tomorrow's timing is the same as today. OK, we will start the session at two o'clock and try to end it as soon as possible. Guys, I already shared feedback form. Please go and fill this feedback form if you like this session.